Brought to you by WikiVD Documentaries. Marilyn Monroe. Marilyn Monroe was an American actress and model. Famous for playing comic, dumb blonde characters, she became one of the most popular sex symbols of the 1950s and was emblematic of the era's attitudes towards sexuality. Although she was a top billed actress, for only a decade, her films grossed $200 million by the time of her unexpected death in 1962. She continues to be considered a major popular culture icon. Born and raised in Los Angeles, Monroe spent most of her childhood in foster homes and an orphanage and married at the age of 16. While working in a radio plane factory in 1944 as part of the war effort, she was introduced to a photographer from the first motion picture unit and began a successful pin-up modeling career. The work led to short-lived film contracts with 20th Century Fox and Columbia Pictures. After a series of minor film roles, she signed a new contract with Fox in 1951. Over the next two years, she became a popular actress with roles in several comedies, including As Young As You Feel and Monkey Business, and in the dramas Clash by Night and Don't Bother to Knock. Monroe faced a scandal when it was revealed that she had posed for nude photos before becoming a star, but rather than damaging her career, the story resulted in increased interest in her films. By 1953, Monroe was one of the most marketable Hollywood stars, with leading roles in three films, The Noir Niagara, which focused on her sex appeal, and the comedies Gentlemen Prefer Blondes and How to Marry a Millionaire, which established her star image as a dumb blonde. Although she played a significant role in the creation and management of her public image throughout her career, she was disappointed at being typecast and underpaid by the studio. She was briefly suspended in early 1954 for refusing a film project, but returned to star in one of the biggest box office successes of her career, The Seven Year Itch. When the studio was still reluctant to change her contract, Monroe founded a film production company in late 1954. She named it Marilyn Monroe Productions. She dedicated 1955 to building her company and began studying method acting at the Actors Studio. In late 1955, Fox awarded her a new contract, which gave her more control and a larger salary. After a critically acclaimed performance in Bus Stop and acting in the first independent production of MMP, The Prince and the Showgirl, she won a Golden Globe for Best Actress for Some Like It Hot. Her last completed film was the drama The Misfits. Munro's troubled private life received much attention. She struggled with substance abuse, depression, and anxiety. She had two highly publicized marriages to retired baseball star Joe DiMaggio and playwright Arthur Miller, both of which ended in divorce. On August 5, 1962, she died at age 36 from an overdose of barbiturates at her home in Los Angeles. Although Munro's death was ruled a probable suicide, several conspiracy theories have been proposed in the decades following her death. Childhood and first marriage 1926-1944 Monroe was born Norma Jean Mortensen at the Los Angeles County Hospital on June 1, 1926, as the third child of Gladys Pearl Baker, Gladys, the daughter of two poor Midwestern migrants, to California, was a flapper and worked as a film negative cutter. It consolidated film industries. When she was 15, Gladys married a man nine years her senior, John Newton Baker, and had two children by him, Robert and Bernice. She filed for divorce in 1921, and Baker took the children with him. 
to his native Kentucky. Monroe was not told that she had a sister until she was 12, and met her for the first time as an adult. In 1924, Gladys married her second husband, Martin Edward Mortensen, but they separated before she became pregnant with Munro by a different man. They divorced in 1928. The identity of Munro's father is unknown and Baker was most often used as her surname. Munro's early childhood was stable and happy, while Gladys was mentally and financially unprepared. For a child, she was able to place Monroe with foster parents Albert and Ida Bollander in the rural town of Hawthorne soon after the birth. They raised their foster children according to the principles of evangelical Christianity. At first, Gladys lived with the Bollanders and commuted to work in Los Angeles, until longer work shifts forced her to move back to the city in early 1927. She then began visiting her daughter on weekends, often taking her to the cinema and to sightsee in Los Angeles. Although the Bollanders wanted to adopt Munro by the summer of 1933, Gladys felt stable enough for Munro to move in with her and bought a small house in Hollywood. They shared it with lodgers, actors George and Maud Atkins and their daughter, Nellie. Some months later, in January 1934, Gladys had a mental breakdown and was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. After several months in a rest home, she was committed to the Metropolitan State Hospital. She spent the rest of her life in and out of hospitals and was rarely in contact with Munro. Munro became a ward of the state and her mother's friend, Grace McKee Goddard, took responsibility over her and her mother's affairs. In the following four years, she lived with several foster families, and often switched schools. For the first 16 months, she continued living with the Atkinsons, she was sexually abused. During this time, always a shy girl, she now also developed a stutter and became withdrawn. In the summer of 1935, she briefly stayed with Grace and her husband Erwin, Doc, Goddard, and two other families, until Grace placed her in the Los Angeles Orphans' Home in Hollywood in September 1935. While the orphanage was a model institution and was described in positive terms by her peers, Monroe found being placed there traumatizing, as to her, it seemed that no one wanted me. Encouraged by the orphanage staff who thought that Monroe would be happier living in a family, Grace became her legal guardian in 1936, although she was not able to take her out of the orphanage until the summer of 1937. Munro's second stay, with the Goddards lasted only a few months as Doc molested her. After staying with various of her and Grace's relatives and friends in Los Angeles and Compton, Monroe found a more permanent home in September 1938 when she began living with Grace's aunt, Anna Atchison Lower, in the Sawtell district. She was enrolled in Emerson Junior High School and was taken to weekly Christian science services with Loa. While otherwise a mediocre student, Monroe excelled in writing and contributed to the school's newspaper. Due to the elderly Loa's health issues, Monroe returned to live with the Goddards in Van Nuys in either late 1940 or early 1941. After graduating from Emerson, she began attending Van Nuys a High School. In early 1942, the company that Doc Goddard worked for required him to relocate to West Virginia. California laws prevented the Goddards from taking Munro out of state, and she faced the possibility of having to return to the orphanage. As a solution, she married their neighbor's son, 21-year-old factory worker James Jim Doherty on June 19, 1942. Just after her 16th birthday, Monroe subsequently dropped out of high school and became a housewife. She later stated that the marriage didn't make me sad. 
but it didn't make me happy, either. My husband and I hardly spoke to each other. This wasn't because we were angry. We had nothing to say. I was dying of boredom. In 1943, Doherty enlisted in the Merchant Marine. He was initially stationed on Catalina Island, where she lived with him until he was shipped out to the Pacific in April 1944. He would remain there for most of the next two years. After Doherty's deployment, Monroe moved in with his parents and began working at the radio plane munitions factory to participate in the war effort and to earn her own income. Modeling and first film roles 1945-1949 in late 1944, Monroe met photographer David Conover, who had been sent by the U.S. Army Air Force's first motion picture unit to the factory to shoot morale-boosting pictures of female workers. Although none of her pictures were used by the FMPU, she quit working at the factory in January 1945 and began modeling for Conover and his friends. She moved out of her in-law's home, defying them and her husband, and signed a contract with the Blue Book Model Agency in August 1945. She began to occasionally use the name Jean Norman when working, and had her curly brunette hair straightened and dyed blonde to make her more employable, as her figure was deemed more suitable for pin-up than fashion modeling. She was featured mostly in advertisements and men's magazines. According to the agency's owner, Emmeline Snively, Monroe was one of its most ambitious and hard-working models by early 1946. She had appeared on 33 magazine covers for publications such as Pageant, U.S. Camera, Luff, and Peak. Impressed by her success, Snively arranged a contract for Monroe with an acting agency in June 1946. After an unsuccessful interview with producers at Paramount Pictures, she was given a screen test by Ben Leon, a 20th Century Fox executive. Head executive Daryl F. Zanuck was unenthusiastic about it, but he was persuaded to give her a standard six-month contract to avoid her being signed by rival studio RKO Pictures. Munro's contract began in August 1946, and she and Leon selected the stage name, Marilyn Munro. The first name was picked by Leon, who was reminded of Broadway star Marilyn Miller. The last was picked by Munro after her mother's maiden name. In September 1946, she divorced Doherty, who was against her having a career. Munro had no film roles during the first months of her contract and instead dedicated her days to acting, singing, and dancing classes, eager to learn more about the film industry and to promote herself. She also spent time at the studio lot to observe others working. Her contract was renewed in February 1947, and she was soon given her first two film roles, nine lines of dialogue as a waitress in the drama. Dangerous Years and a one-line appearance in the comedy Scudder Who. Scudder Hey. The studio also unrolled her in the Actors Laboratory Theatre, an acting school teaching the techniques of the group theatre. She later stated that it was my first taste of what real acting in a real drama could be, and I was hooked. Munro's contract was not renewed in August 1947, and she returned to modeling while also doing occasional odd jobs at the studio. Determined to make it as an actress, Monroe continued studying at the actor's lab, and in October she appeared as a blonde vamp in the short-lived play Glamour Preferred at the Bliss Hayden Theatre, but the production was not reviewed by any major publication. To promote herself, she frequented producers' offices befriended gossip columnist Sidney Skolsky and entertained influential male guests at studio functions, a practice she had begun at Fox. She also became a friend and occasional sex partner of Fox executive Joseph M. Schenck, 
who persuaded his friend Harry Cohn, the head executive of Columbia Pictures, to sign her in March 1948. While at Fox, her roles had been that of a girl next door. At Columbia, she was modeled after Rita Hayworth. Munro's hairline was raised by electrolysis, and her hair was bleached even lighter, to platinum blonde. She also began working with the studio's head drama coach Natasha Lytus, who would remain her mentor until 1955. Her only film at the studio was the low-budget musical Ladies of the Chorus in which she had her first starring role as a chorus girl who is courted by a wealthy man. During the production, she began an affair with her vocal coach, Fred Cugger, who paid to have her slight overbite corrected. Despite the starring role and a subsequent screen test for the lead role in Born Yesterday, Munro's contract was not renewed. Ladies of the Chorus was released in October and was not a success. After leaving Columbia in September 1948, Monroe became the protégé of Johnny Hyde, who was the vice president of the William Morris Agency. Hyde represented her, and the relationship soon became sexual, although she refused his proposals of marriage. To advance Munro's career, he paid for a silicone prosthesis to be implanted in her jaw, and possibly for a rhinoplasty, and arranged a bit part in the Marx Brothers film Love Happy. Munro also continued modeling, and in May 1949 she posed nude for photos taken by Tom Kelly. Although her role in Love Happy was very small, she was chosen to participate in the film's promotional tour in New York that year. Breakthrough Years 1950-1952 Monroe appeared in six films that were released in 1950. She had bit parts in Love Happy, A Ticket to Tomahawk, Right Cross and the Fireball but also made minor appearances in two critically acclaimed films, John Huston's crime film The Asphalt Jungle and Joseph Mankiewicz's drama All About Eve. In the former, Monroe played Angela, the young mistress of an aging criminal. Although only on the screen for five minutes, she gained a mention in photoplay and according to Spoto, moved effectively from movie model to serious actress. In All About Eve, Monroe played Miss Caswell, a naive young actress. Following Monroe's success in these roles, Hyde negotiated a seven-year contract with 20th Century Fox in December 1950. He died of a heart attack only days later, which left her devastated. Despite her grief, 1951 became the year in which she gained more visibility. In March, she was a presenter at the 23rd Academy Awards and in September, Colliers became the first national magazine to publish a full-length profile of her. She had supporting roles in four low-budget films, in the MGM drama Hometown Story, and in three moderately successful comedies for Fox, As Young As You Feel, Love Nest, and Let's Make It Legal. According to Spoto all four films featured her, essentially, as a sexy ornament, but she received some praise. From critics, Bosley Crowther of the New York Times described her as, superb. In As Young As You Feel and Ezra Goodman of the Los Angeles Daily News called her, one of the brightest up-and-coming, actresses, for Love Nest. To further develop her acting skills, Monroe began taking classes with Michael Chekhov and Mime Lottie Goslar. Her popularity with audiences was also growing, she received several thousand letters of fan mail a week, and was declared Miss Cheesecake of 1951 by the Army newspaper Stars and Stripes, reflecting the preferences of soldiers in the Korean War. In her private life, Monroe was in a relationship with director Alia Kazan, and also briefly dated several other men, including director Nicholas Ray and actors Yul Brynner and Peter Lawford. 
Monroe became a top-billed actress in the second year of the Fox contract. Gossip columnist Flora Bell Muir named her the It Girl of 1952, and Hedda Hopper described her as the Cheesecake Queen turned box office smash. In February, she was named the Best Young Box Office Personality by the Foreign Press Association of Hollywood, and began a highly publicized romance with retired New York Yankee Joe DiMaggio, who was one of the most famous sports personalities of the era. The following month, a scandal broke when she revealed in an interview that during 1949 she had posed for nude pictures, which were featured in calendars. Fox had learned of the photographs some weeks earlier and, to contain the potentially disastrous effects on her career, the studio and Monroe had decided to talk about them openly while stressing that she had only posed for the photos while she was in a dire financial situation. The strategy succeeded in getting her public sympathy and increased interest in her films. The following month, she was featured on the cover of Life as the talk of Hollywood, Monroe added to her reputation as a new sex symbol, with other publicity stunts that year, such as wearing a revealing dress, when acting as Grand Marshal at the Miss America pageant parade, and by stating to gossip columnist Earl Wilson that she usually wore no underwear. Regardless of her popularity and sex appeal, Monroe wished to present more of her acting range and in the summer of 1952 she appeared in two commercially successful dramas. The first was Fritz Lang's Clash by Night, for which she was loaned to RKO, and played a fish cannery worker. To prepare, she spent time in a real fish cannery in Monterey. She received positive reviews for her performance. The Hollywood Reporter stated that, she deserves starring status with her excellent interpretation, and Variety wrote that she has an ease of delivery which makes her a cinch for popularity. The second film was the thriller Don't Bother to Knock, in which she starred as a mentally disturbed babysitter and which Zanuck had assigned for her to test her abilities in a heavier dramatic role. It received mixed reviews from critics with Crowther deeming her too inexperienced for the difficult role, and Variety blaming the script for the film's problems. Munro's three other films in 1952 continued typecasting her in comic roles that focused on her sex appeal. In We're Not Married, her starring role as a beauty pageant contestant was created solely to present Marilyn in two bathing suits, according to its writer Nunnally Johnson. In Howard Hawke's Monkey Business, in which she was featured opposite Cary Grant, she played a secretary who is a dumb, childish blonde, innocently unaware of the havoc her sexiness causes around her. In No Henry's Full House, her final film of the year, she had a minor role as a prostitute. During this period, Monroe gained a reputation for being difficult on film sets. The difficulties worsened as her career progressed. She was often later did not show up at all, did not remember her lines, and would demand several retakes before she was satisfied with her performance. Monroe's dependence on her acting coaches, first Natasha Lytus, and later Paula Strasberg also irritated directors. Munro's problems have been attributed to a combination of perfectionism, low self-esteem, and stage fright. She disliked the lack of control she had on her work on film sets, and never experienced similar problems during photo shoots, in which she had more say over her performance and could be more spontaneous instead of following a script. To alleviate her anxiety and chronic insomnia, she began to use barbiturates, amphetamines, and alcohol, which also exacerbated her problems. Although she did not become severely addicted until 1956, 
According to Sarah Churchwell, some of Munro's behavior especially later in her career was also in response to the condescension and sexism of her male co-stars and directors. Similarly, Lois Banner has stated that she was bullied by many of her directors. Rising Star 1953 Monroe starred in three movies that were released in 1953 and emerged as a major sex symbol and one of Hollywood's most bankable performers. The first of these was the Technicolor film Noir Niagara, in which she played a femme fatale scheming to murder her husband, played by Joseph Cotton. By then, Munro and her makeup artist Alan Whitey Snyder had developed the makeup look that became associated with her dark arched brows, pale skin, glistening red lips, and a beauty mark. According to Sarah Churchwell, Niagara was one of the most overtly sexual films of Munro's career, and it included scenes in which her body was covered only by a sheet or a towel. Considered shocking by contemporary audiences, its most famous scene is a 30-second long shot of Munro shown walking from behind, with her hips swaying, which was heavily used in the film's marketing. When Niagara was released in January, women's clubs protested that the film was immoral. But the movie proved popular with audiences and grossed $6 million at the box office. While Variety deemed it cliched and morbid, the New York Times commented that the falls and Miss Monroe are something to see, as although Monroe may not be the perfect actress, at this point, she can be seductive even when she walks. Monroe continued to attract attention with her revealing outfits in publicity events, most famously at the Photoplay Awards in January 1953, where she won the Fastest Rising Star Award. She wore a skin-tight gold lamé dress, which prompted veteran star Joan Crawford to describe her behavior as unbecoming an actress and a lady to the press. While Niagara made Munro a sex symbol and established her look, her second film of the year, the satirical musical comedy Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, established her screen persona as a dumb blonde, based on Anita Luce's best-selling novel and its Broadway version. The film focuses on two gold-digging showgirls, Laura Lee and Dorothy Shaw, played by Munro and Jane Russell. The role of Laura Lee was originally intended for Betty Grable, who had been 20th Century Fox's most popular blonde bombshell in the 1940s. Munro was fast eclipsing her as a star who could appeal to both male and female audiences. As part of the film's publicity campaign, she and Russell pressed their hand and footprints in wet concrete outside Grauman's Chinese Theatre in June. Gentlemen Prefer Blondes was released shortly after and became one of the biggest box office successes of the year by grossing $5.3 million, more than double its production costs. Crowther of the New York Times and William Brogdon of Variety both commented favorably on Munro, especially noting her performance of Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend. According to the latter, she demonstrated the ability to sex a song as well as point up the eye values of a scene by her presence. In September, Munro made her television debut in The Jack Benny Show, playing Jack's fantasy woman in the episode Honolulu Trip. She co-starred with Betty Grable and Lauren Bacall in her third movie of the year, How to Marry a Millionaire, which was released in November. It featured Munro in the role of a naive model who teams up with her friends to find rich husbands, repeating the successful formula of gentlemen prefer blondes. It was the second film ever released in Cinemascope a widescreen format that Fox hoped would draw audiences back to theaters as television was beginning to cause losses to film studios. Despite mixed reviews, 
The film was Munro's biggest box office success at that point in her career, earning $8 million in world rentals. Monroe was listed in the annual Top 10 Money Making Stars poll in both 1953 and 1954, and according to Fox historian Aubrey Solomon became the studio's greatest asset. Alongside Cinemascope, Monroe's position as a leading sex symbol was confirmed in December 1953, when Hugh Hefner featured her on the cover and as centerfold in the first issue of Playboy. The cover image was a photograph taken of her at the Miss America pageant parade in 1952, and the centerfold featured one of her 1949 nude photographs. Conflicts with 20th Century Fox and Marriage to Joe DiMaggio 1954-1955 Although Monroe had become one of 20th Century Fox's biggest stars, her contract had not changed since 1950, meaning that she was paid far less than other stars of her stature, and could not choose her projects or co-workers. She was also tired of being typecast, and her attempts to appear in films other than comedies and musicals had been thwarted by Zanuck who had a strong personal dislike of her, and did not think she would earn the studio as much revenue in dramas. When she refused to begin shooting yet another musical comedy, a film version of The Girl in Pink Tights, which was to co-star Frank Sinatra, the studio suspended her on January 4, 1954. The suspension was front-page news and Munro immediately began a publicity campaign to counter any negative press and to strengthen her position in the conflict. On January 14, she and Joe DiMaggio, whose relationship had been subject to constant media attention since 1952, were married at San Francisco City Hall. They then traveled to Japan, combining a honeymoon with his business trip. From there, she traveled alone to Korea, where she performed songs from her films as part of a USO show for over 60,000 US Marines over a four-day period. After returning to Hollywood in February, she was awarded Photo Plays, Most Popular Female Star Prize. She reached a settlement with the studio in March. It included a new contract to be made later in the year, and a starring role in the film version of the Broadway play The Seven Year Itch, for which she was to receive a bonus of $100,000. Munro's next film was Otto Preminger's Western River of No Return, which had been filmed prior to her suspension and featured Robert Mitchum as her co-star. She called it a Z-grade cowboy movie in which the acting finished second to the scenery and the cinemascope process, although it was popular with audiences. The first film she made after returning to Fox was the musical There's No Business Like Show Business, which she strongly disliked. But the studio required her to do in exchange for dropping the girl in pink tights. The musical was unsuccessful upon its release in December, and Munro's performance was considered vulgar by many critics. In September 1954, Monroe began filming Billy Wilder's comedy The Seven Year Itch, in which she starred opposite Tom Yule as a woman who becomes the object of her married neighbor's sexual fantasies. Although the film was shot in Hollywood, the studio decided to generate advance publicity by staging the filming of a scene on Lexington Avenue in New York. In the shoot, Monroe is standing on a subway grate, with the air blowing up the skirt of her white dress, which became one of the most famous scenes of her career. The shoot lasted for several hours, and attracted a crowd of nearly 2,000 spectators, including professional photographers. While the publicity stunt placed Munro on international front pages, it also marked the end of her marriage to DiMaggio, who was furious about the stunt. 
The Union had been troubled from the start by his jealousy and controlling attitude. Spotto and Banner have also asserted that he was physically abusive. After returning to Hollywood, Monroe hired famous attorney Jerry Giesler and announced in October 1954 that she was filing for divorce. The seven-year itch was released the following June, and grossed over $4.5 million at the box office, making it one of the biggest commercial successes that year. After filming for Itch Wrapped in November, Monroe began a new battle for control over her career and left Hollywood for the East Coast, where she and photographer Milton Green founded their own production company, Marilyn Monroe Productions in action that has later been called instrumental in the collapse of the studio system. Announcing its foundation in a press conference in January 1955, Monroe stated that she was tired of the same old sex roles. I wanted a better things. People have scope, you know. She asserted that she was no longer under contract to Fox, as the studio had not fulfilled its duties, such as paying her the promised bonus for the seven-year itch. This began a year-long legal battle between her and the studio. The press largely ridiculed Munro for her actions, and she was parodied in itch writer George Axelrod's Will Success Spoil Rock Hunter, in which her look-alike Jane Mansfield played a dumb actress who starts her own production company. Monroe dedicated 1955 to studying her craft. She moved to New York and began taking acting classes, with Constance Collier and attending workshops on method acting at the Actors Studio, run by Lee Strasberg. She sometimes jotted down private notes to herself of what she learned on a given day, acknowledging that Strasberg's observations about her in particular were important, she grew close to Strasberg and his wife Paula, receiving private lessons at their home due to her shyness, and soon became like a family member, she dismissed her old drama coach, Natasha Lytus, and replaced her with Paula, the Strasbergs remained an important influence. For the rest of her career, Monroe also started undergoing psychoanalysis. At the recommendation of Strasberg, who believed that an actor must confront their emotional traumas and use them in their performances. In her private life, Monroe continued her relationship with DiMaggio despite the ongoing divorce proceedings. She also dated actor Marlon Brando and playwright Arthur Miller. She had first been introduced to Miller by Kazan in the early 1950s. The affair between Monroe and Miller became increasingly serious after October 1955, when her divorce from DiMaggio was finalized, and Miller separated from his wife. The FBI also opened a file on her. The studio feared that Monroe would be blacklisted and urged her to end the affair, as Miller was being investigated by the FBI for allegations of communism and had been subpoenaed by the House Un-American Activities Committee. Despite the risk to her career, Monroe refused to end the relationship, later calling the studio heads born cowards. By the end of the year, Monroe and Fox had come to an agreement about a new seven-year contract. It was clear that MMP would not be able to finance films alone, and the studio was eager to have Monroe working again. The contract required her to make four movies for Fox during the seven years. The studio would pay her $100,000 for each movie, and granted her the right to choose her own projects, directors and cinematographers. She would also be free to make one film with MMP per each completed film for Fox. Thank you for watching. Brought to you by WikiVD Documentaries. Please like and subscribe below.
please like and subscribe below.